the Fellowship of the Great Physician welcomes you to House Call. Our hosts today are doctors of chiropractic, Dr. Gerald Lala and Dr. Richard Jensen, who is also a board-certified acupuncturist, practice independently in North Oaks, Minnesota. And Dr. David Schwedert practices in Rapid City, South Dakota. Let's join our hosts for today's program that will assist you in your quest for optimum health and well-being. Welcome to House Call. I'm Dr. Gerald Lala. I'm Dr. David Sweeter. I'm Dr. Richard Jensen. It's wonderful to have you with us again today. We hope that you're well. We hope that you're enjoying your day. We hope that uh, you have an open mind and an open heart to learning more about enzymes and health because you cannot really function and have health without proper enzymes. No way can you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we think we know a little bit about it as doctors of chiropractic. Uh, we work with enzymes every day. For many of the people who have health problems that come and consult with us, we find that there are enzyme irregularities and deficiencies. And many times these people are also taking enzymes and those enzymes that they're taking aren't doing the job. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're going to talk about enzymes, which ones work, which ones don't, when they work best in your body. And uh, so I think you're going to have a really a good program. So, Dr. David Sweetert, our esteemed colleague from Rapid City, South Dakota, which is God's country. And if you're ever going on vacation out there, just call them and they've got a couple extra bedrooms and you can, <laughs> you can stay there. His wife yeah. will be happy to have you. Plus, they have a 2,000 acre organic farm out there that his wife manages and uh, you can go out there and help pull weeds, naturally, of course. Of course. <laughs> you bad guy. You. I'll get you for that. Well, let's talk about enzymes. You know, enzymes are, are life dependent on, in the body that we can't live without them. Enzymes or enzyme reactions are going on 24 four hours a day all up and down our digestive tract. They are important to digestion and assimilation and to our overall health and life. But people say, well, gee, Dr. Sweeter, what are enzymes? Well, enzymes are amino acids, amino acids or proteins or building blocks of the body that stimulate and increase or catalyze the force or velocity of chemical reactions that happen within the body as my good friend Dr. Lala would say they're the spark plug that keeps the gas and ignites the fire and keeps things going so that spark is always going and without a spark you can have all the gas in the world you can have all the food in the world but without enzymes it'll just pass through if it passes through at all so enzymes help in the chemical activities that are involved in breaking down foods without destroying themselves they are easily identified if you see something that has the suffix ASE on the end of it, you'll know that that's an enzyme. There are two forms of these catalysts, the, those positive and negative. Positive increase the velocity and negative slow it down. So we have enzymes that speed things up, enzymes that slow things down in the chemical activity of the body. When a person is ill, the positive roles and the activity of the enzymes are diminished. So that's why you know, it's just like somebody just shutting off the hose. There's less and less force, there's less and less volume, and therefore those enzymes just decrease. Now, Dr. Jensen is going to take us to the next level. Thank you, Dr. Sweetert. Well, there are six major groups of enzymes, and they're classified as oxidoreductase, transferase, hydroxylase, lysase, isomerase, and lipase. And so what they're doing is they'll lysase, lysis things. Uh, isomerase will actually make isomers out of what they're, what they're doing. Lipases will cut up fats. Oxidose reductase reduces the oxidation parts of them. Transferases moves things from side to side. Hydroxylases cut through areas that, that have hydrogen or hydrogen dependent. So these, these all these different kinds of chemicals, these enzymes, are then broken up into two major forms, two types of enzymes, plant and animal. To varying degree, all plants, that's fruits and vegetables, and the animals contain enzymes, which are designed to complement 
health and well-being. We need some from both areas, okay? Some we produce ourselves, others we need to get from other sources. Mainly the plant ones we need to get from the, the, the fruits and vegetables that we're eating. So then let's go into plant enzymes. Plant en enzymes are heat labile. Therefore, being heat labile, they are destroyed when they are frozen, okay? Pasteurized or exposed to temperatures of 118 degrees Fahrenheit or higher also destroy these enzymes, okay? It just kind of messes up their whole chemical composition, denatures them so that they're, they're, rendered, un, they're rendered useless. There are four varieties of plant enzymes. Amylase, which works with carbohydrates. Protease, which works with proteins. Lipase, which helps slice up our fats. And cellulase, which slices up fiber. Cellulase, we don't create ourselves, okay? So in order, most plants, they have, you know, when you looked in, in uh, biology class, they have these cells that, that the cells are, are surrounded by cellulose. And so we don't have the enzyme to break that open. So either that has to take place in either the cooking, which you destroy some of the enzymes, or you've got to release it in the chewing to release that, those enzymes so that that can then help you to digest those things and, and open up the cells to get the nutrients out of it that you needed. So let's go to amylase first, and let's go to Dr. Lala for further knowledge on that. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Amylase, A-M-Y-L-A-S-E, as Dr. Sweetert said, the uh, suffix uh, A-S-E indicates that it is an enzymic compound. Amylase is an enzyme involved in hydrolyzing, and the term hydrolyzing in simple terms means breaking down, and this will be a bit technical now, but don't let it overwhelm you, the hydrolyzing of alpha-1,4 glucoside bonds of starch. In other words, starch just isn't like glued together. It has bonds. It's bound together by these glucoside bonds, which then are designed to decrease the velocity, uh, uh, viscosity of, or the thickness. So viscosity is thickness of amylose, amylopectin. We've talked about pectin before. That's what's under the the skin of apples as an example, and gelatinous starch in water-soluble dextrin as well as freeing glucose and maltose. So in all forms of pectin-containing compounds like jello, um, what's the stuff that comes in a green box, um, or a little orange box? Can't gelatin. Remember, uh, gelatin. This is what we're really talking about here. So the amylase is very involved. Now Dr. Sweeter is going to talk about maltase. Maltase is, assists the body in further breaking down maltose, which is a form of sugar. So again, a specific enzyme for breaking down a specific product. Dr. Jensen. Thank you. Uh, then we have glucoamylase, which is involved in hydrolyzing maltose into glucose. It, maltose is a disaccharide, which is two sugars together, and it, it splits that together into two glucose. So we're actually making simple sugars out of it. Then lactase, lactase is, you know, you hear about people who are lactose intolerant. They don't contain the enzyme that allows them to break apart the, uh, the sugars in milk into their constituents of glucose and galactose, which are both simple sugars then. It is estimated that 80% of society has a lactose intolerance. How about sucrase? That's the inverse. It hydrolyzes sucrose, refined table sugar, into fructose, and glucose. It is felt that many allergy problems are related to sucrose intolerance. Dr. Sweetert. You know, it's interesting that we talk about uh, sucrose intolerance. Uh, a lot of people are, are kind of unaware, but if you just start reading labels, you would be amazed at the amount of sugar and the, you know, it won't say sugar is the, the number one ingredient or the number two or three ingredient, but if you add up all the oses afterwards, that you'll find that a lot of the products, especially in the middle aisles of the grocery store, 
Uh, when you read the labels, they have a lot of different forms of sugar, and actually they got sugar forms in there that I've never even heard of yet. That's, that points out that a lot of people who are on low-carbohydrate diets, in fact, are eating foods unbeknownst to them where there are hidden sugars in them. Absolutely. And, of course, because in certain products there's no requirement that they have uh, a label that uh, right. tells what it is there, those are the hidden sugars that, uh, you know, get us. That's right. The FDA does not require... Uh, listing of it unless it's over a certain number of grams. That's right. So if, if you end up breaking down the different sugars into small enough portions, you don't even have to list it. And so it can be a high sugar carbohydrate product and you're not aware of it. Right. Well, let's look at alpha-galactosidase. It hydrolyzes the oligosaccharides that are commonly found in, okay, so let's make it simple. These enzymes will break down grains, vegetables, and legumes. Human body is incapable of breaking these oligosaccharides down, and if consumed without enzyme supplementation, bacteria within the digestive tract results in fermentation, bloating, and intestinal gas. So now you can start to maybe understand why it's important to have some of those tests. If you're having digestive disturbances, if you're, having, if you're taking drugs to try to either increase or decrease something within your digestive tract, whether it's gas or bloating or indigestion or that, you know, full feeling, whatever it is, remember it's an, energy, it's an energy pipe from the mouth to the anus. And so different things happen along at different stages of the process. And as we talk about these enzyme reactions, some of them are active in pHs, uh, high pHs, and some are active in low pHs. So it's really, really important if you're having difficulty, if you're starting to have symptoms, don't just cover it up with a drug. Just find, go, keep searching until you find the cause of what's going on because there is an answer out there. And if you turn it over often enough and look deep enough, you will find an answer for the problem that you've got. Dr. Lala. And what we're talking about here today is enzymes and health and the particular area that we're involved with right now are plant enzymes and as uh, Dr. Jensen mentioned here a few moments ago, in case uh, this is for you who just may have tuned in, there are four varieties of plant enzymes. Number one, amylase for digest carbohydrates. Number two, protease that digest proteins. Number three, lipase which di assists in digesting fats and cellulase which assists in digesting fiber. And so now we're going to look at the second category, cellulase. Cellulase is comprised of the enzymes hemocellulase and phytase that transform cellulase found in plant fibers into glucose, into sugar. Phytase is involved in digesting phytates, which are found in wheat bran. If not properly digested, minerals such as calcium, iron, zinc, manganese, magnesium, and others will not be chelated or electronically, chemically bound to proteins or amino acids in the small intestine, that's the distal end of the small intestine where it has to be alkaline environment. The proximal end of the small intestines is supposed to be acid yet, uh, and thus preventing assimilation and predisposing the body to mineral deficiencies. So now, uh, I think we'll do is bring up a little pamphlet for you if you're interested in amino acids and enzymes. This pamphlet is wonderful, just really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Basically states everything that's, that we're talking about here today and that's all you have to do is uh, call the number on the screen and request the literature that they were talking about and, um, and le leave your telephone number or your address and uh, we'll be happy to mail that to you at no charge. So, Dr. David Sweetert, you're going to discuss a protease? Right. Protease is involved in the breaking down of proteins and polypeptides. These enzymes have functional pH differences. What's pH mean? pH is a scale of acid and alkalinity. Zero would be just severe, you know, really highly acid, and 12 or 13 or 14 would be very alkaline. So uh, what we call neutral is right around 7. So anything under seven is more of the acidic scale. Anything over seven, seven and up, is on the alkaline scale. So these enzymes have functional pH differences, meaning that some function solely in, solely in an acid environment, while others 
only act, work in an alkaline environment. Those who supplement their diets, and that's really a lot of us today, with protease are best served by taking a broad spectrum pH protease, which encourages better digestion in the acid pH of three to five in the stomach and proximal end of the small intestine, as well as the alkaline pH or seven or above in the distal end of the small intestine. Other protease type enzymes include peptidase, papaya, or papain, and bromelain, which comes from pineapple. That's unpasteurized pineapple. That's right, raw. And that's really important because, you know, if you go into the store and you want to buy um, uh, papain or uh, bromelain, you know, there's different activities of it. And then, of course, there's food grade versus pharmaceutical grade. So, Dr. Lal, what's the difference between food grade and pharmaceutical grade? Well, most of the food supplements sold in America are, in fact, not manufactured in America, but in China. And um, they, it uh, doesn't mean that they would be bad coming from China, but uh, when there's a food grade, it means that the company producing it can manufacture it any way that they want. They, nobody, they do not have to submit their products to independent laboratory analysis. Therefore, what the label says does not necess necessarily mean what's in there, nor are the chemicals or elements within the food supplement necessarily in the proper biochemical ratio. And if they're not, then their bioavailability, in other words, their potential effectiveness is dramatically reduced and very often what happens then is people either have a reaction to taking the food supplements, such as diarrhea or uh, upset stomach, and or it's just excreted through the feces and urine. Pharmaceutical grade food supplements are produced by companies that submit their products for independent laboratory analysis, just like a drug company has to, by law, submit their products for independent laboratory analysis. The FDA does not require any independent laboratory analysis of food supplements. Therefore, recent studies have shown that 80% of all food supplements being sold in America do not have on the label what, this, what they say is on the label, nor are they in proper biochemical ratio. In other words, everything has to be in ratio, for, in the correct chemical ratios for the body to use it effectively and very often those chemical ratios are in proper, uh, proper ratio and there's no way for a person, any person, to know that by looking at the bottle. So what's on the label isn't necessarily the truth. So now let's talk about a little bit more about plant-derived enzymes are designed to help promote better digestion, principally in the stomach through the early part or pre-digestive phase of digestion. Chewing foods is very important, especially relative to releasing cellulase. That's the enzyme we talked about that breaks down fibers and releases the sugars in the fibers. The enzyme that assists in digesting fiber. Vegetables with preservatives or sulfides destroy enzymes. Isn't that interesting? Well, they use a lot of sulfur on vegetables as a preservative and to keep color like in apricots. If you're buying an apricot that looks just really nice and orange or yellow, you know that that's got sulfur, that it's been sulfurized. Now, how about, uh, Dr. Sweeter, animal enzymes? Thank you. Well, you know, talking about sulfur, it reminds us that just a couple of years ago, you know, there was a lot of people, a lot of restaurants were putting uh, sulfates on their uh, salad bars. And a lot of people were having uh, unbeknownst allergic reactions to the sulfates that were on these salad bars. So, of course, we've seen a trend away from that. But it's kind of like MSG. If you don't ask, you don't get told what the truth yeah, is. And there are many times um, that uh, because the government, how can they go out and check all these restaurants? They can't. So it's simple enough to just continue to use, uh, put on salad bars, uh, ones that have been treated with sulfides. Yeah. It's not a problem, or MSG, but then you go and see people have reactions and you know it's in there. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the other day, my uh, lovely wife is hypersensitive to MSG and we, went, we were in a restaurant my son took us to and and uh, they said, no MSG, you know MSG. And so she ordered, they said, well, yeah, we can cook it up just that way. And uh, the food came and it looked appealing and my wife ate it and the first bite, she just got an immediate headache, just a histamine reaction headache in the brain from that MSG. 
And the gal, of course, the waitress felt really bad about that, but I, I was suspecting that what happened was that they had used MSG in the cookware in the back. And even though they didn't make any MSG or put anything uh, in the food, making a, her food with it, she got it, and, she, and it took hours, hours before her headache would go away. So, again, it gets back to if you're, if you're sensitive to that, if you don't test, sometimes you don't know, but if you go into a restaurant and everything looks a little bit too good and a little bit too fresh, you know, you might ask the question, you know, do you use any sulfites uh, to keep it fresh, or do you spray anything on that? And by law, they've got to tell you. Dr. Jensen, did you have a thought? Uh, no, I thought you covered that quite well. Well, well good. Animal <laughs> enzymes. Okay, back to animal enzymes. Uh, they're derived from cows or pork, and uh, they function specifically in an alkaline pH, whereas plant-derived enzymes function in a pH of ranging from 2 to 11. Pancreatic enzymes are designed to assist digestion as well as support the body's immune system, and that's really, really important. No mineral, vitamin, or hormone can function without the innate complementary activity of enzymes, which make it possible for the body to be better utilized of their potential functions. So, animal enzymes are really important, especially if we're looking at decreasing the load on the pancreas. And of course, assays, blood tests would tell us, hey, what is our level of amylase or lipase? And uh, are we in trouble digestive-wise? Are we having trouble two to three, four hours after we eat with gas, bloating, and digestive disturbances? So that is a real important part. Dr. Jensen, what do you think about the next part? Well, the next part that we're covering is the pancreas. And uh, in addition to secreting insulin, the pancreas is responsible for secretion of our animal enzymes that we use in digestion, that's the amylase, lipase, and protease. And uh, they, of course, they go into amylase as being uh, to assist us in our carbohydrates, protease in assisting us in digestion of our proteins, and uh, lipase uh, to assist us in our digestion of fats. And so by using that, uh, if, if our pancreas is overworked or overburdened, many times we may have a reduction in the secretion of these chemicals as well as the bicarbonates and so forth that pull our intestinal tract into more of an alkalinity. And by doing that, it, if, if, it's, if it's overworked, it's not secreting enough and therefore we're not uh, able to digest the foods to the point that we're supposed to and therefore not getting the nutrition out of it that we're supposed to. And if you don't have the nutrition, things can't work as well, so it can, it can proliferate into, into health problems down the road. As well as if you have partially digested food, that partially digested food can go on to cause other problems such as uh, food allergies and causing inflammation in, in, uh, in, the, in the bowels, so therefore you have uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. You can uh, go on and have putrefaction of the protein in the bowels and causing some toxins that way. So let's go on further into digestion and enzymes with Dr. Lala. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. Science at this state um, has discovered 22 different uh, digestive enzymes, which in one or more ways are involved in digesting protein, fats, carbohydrates, and cellulase. Digestion is initiated in the brain which interprets through sight, smell, and taste, and stimulates glands within the mouth, pancreas, stomach, and intestines to begin producing digestive elements in anticipation of the food or liquid ingestion. Therefore, the first stage of digestion begins in the mouth where, for the most part, glands secrete enzymes that assist in the digestion of sugars. At that point, the pH of the mouth is slightly acid, and in normal health, the acidity is increased to where it reaches a maximum in the stomach of 5.0 or below 5.0, and that's where, what we call, of course, hydrochloric acid is secreted by the stomach. Now, HCl, or hydrochloric acid, is part, in part reduces the activity of enzymes in the stomach until the food and enzymes reach the distal end 
of the small intestine. That's the duodenum where the pH becomes more alkaline or above 7.0. The pH of the middle and distal aspects of the small intestine have to become alkaline in the, so the small intestine can perform digestion and assimilation activities in an acid pH. For vitamins, minerals, hormones, and antibodies to be absorbed by the small intestine, there has to be an alkaline pH, in other words, above 7.0, making it possible for the amino acids, which are the byproducts of protein digestion, to pick up and transport the vitamins, the minerals, the hormones, the antibodies, etc., through the blood and into your organs and tissues. So some enzymes, as Dr. Sweeter said a little bit ago, work in the stomach. Some work in the, small, in the distal end of the small intestine. Others work in the proximal end of the small intestine. Those that function in the proximal end of the small intestine, the duodenum area, have to be alkaline. Therefore, when you buy an enzyme, a food supplement enzyme, it has to either be plant or animal, and it has to be specific to either the stomach and the proximal end of the small intestine, and another enzyme has to be specific to the distal end of the small intestine where it can operate in a higher pH. And that's very, very important, and that's why most of these enzyme products being sold commercially are not properly put together. They just think people read something, hear something, and they say, gee, I should have some enzymes. Right, maybe you do. Most people do need enzyme supplementation, but we have to determine where they're going to work in your body for them to be effective. So uh, the importance of balanced food intake then. Those who have food intake in high in animal protein have a higher incidence of pancreatic atrophy or hypertrophy, in other words, enlargement of the pancreas, which in turn predisposes issues in them to issues including grade two diabetes, which is adult onset diabetes, cystic fibrosis, we have many patients, cystic fibrosis, they're all on enzymes, but many times those enzymes are just a broad spectrum enzyme rather than a specific enzyme for the stomach and proximal end of the small intestine and another specific enzyme to the distal end of the small intestine. And that's why a lot of these people with cystic fibrosis are not feeling as good as they could if they were on the proper uh, enzymes. Right, guys? That's right. All right. Uh, cystic fibrosis, as Dr. Jensen mentioned here, irritable bowel syndrome, indigestion, intestinal gas, bloating, dyspepsia, sinusitis, asthma. Asthma is often, many of these lung problems are related to enzyme deficiency, allergies, skin problems, viral diseases, multiple sclerosis, and even cancer. So we've talked a lot about enzymes today. When they bring up the telephone number here and the address, I would encourage you to call or write and ask for this literature that we have on enzyme therapy, enzymes and health. It is no charge for it. We have no relationship to any drug or any vitamin company. We're not, we don't receive any money from any vitamin or drug company. We're not salaried by any. We're not consultants to any of those, any of those companies. We're here as a, uh, the fellowship of the great physician. So look to the great physician. Look at what you're putting into your body in the form of foods as well as food supplements and begin to get more and more education and you will encourage your body to live longer and be much healthier. The Fellowship of the Great Physician through its School of Health and Healing provides classes each Thursday evening. The primary focus of these classes is biblically based spiritual health and healing with a brief teaching on physical health and healing. There is no charge or registration fee for these classes, but a free will offering is received. For further information on the School of Health and Healing, class time and location, or the topics discussed on today's program, contact us at the Fellowship of the Great Physician in care of Dr. Lala or Dr. Jensen at 200 Village Center Drive, Suite 100, North Oaks, Minnesota, 55127 or telephone us at 651-484-8521 or contact us at the Fellowship of the Great Physician in care of Dr. David Schwedert at 3936 Jackson Boulevard, Rapid City, South Dakota, 
5-7702, telephone 605-721-3861. Thank you for joining us today.